thank you for the introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I think I'm the only person at the meeting who is really talking about quantum metrology, although I understand that Ethan Steinberg uh, did talk about some things which, which touch it. Um, and so I will, I will start by somehow uh, making an apology. And the apology is that since I'm in a room full of people who think of quantum metrology as a quantum computing problem, you might even think of it as an easy quantum computing problem compared to other things that, that you work on. Uh, I'm a physicist, and I'm going to somehow use my time to make an argument for thinking of this as a, as a physics problem. So we, we know the quantum metrology problem as, as this, that you start with a number of individual systems, which you might think of as qubits, and they interact with the environment. Uh, they interact with some unknown parameter that changes their state, and you're trying to figure out what this is. And if you do this in a naive way, and you do an independent preparation of your qubits, then the best you can do is the standard quantum limit, which gives you an uncertainty that scales as 1 over square root of n in estimating the unknown thing that you're trying to determine. And if you're smart, and you have a quantum computer, then you can prepare some input state which does a better job of this, and that allows you to reach the Heisenberg limit, uh, which is then a different scaling and a better sensitivity given the same resources. And this model of quantum computing is, is somehow the bottom-up idea that you identify from this the best that you can do with a certain number of qubits, and then you go into the lab and you try to build as many qubits as, as you can. And uh, I did that uh, at some point with Ephraim Steinberg and Jeff Lundin, uh, in 2004, we generated a three-particle noon state, which then achieved the Heisenberg limit. Uh, over time, that's gone up to four photons to five photons. And in material systems, the numbers go up to 10. That generated 10 qubit uh, noon states. And in that way, they were able to get the most that they could out of that system. But now as we enter into the quantum technology era, it's not enough to do the best that you can possibly do. You have to actually do well. And what we're competing against here are technologies, atomic clocks, magnetometers, gravitational wave detectors, that do uh, the naive strategy, but with a large number of qubits. So an atomic clock has a thousand to a million. A modern atomic clock has a thousand to a million uh, atoms in it. Magnetometers might have 10 to the 12 and gravitational wave detectors are using about 10 to the 17 photons per millisecond, which is about their time resolution. And so if you think about what it takes in the bottom-up strategy to compete with that, then that's 30 to 1,000 logical qubits for the easiest of these applications, and it becomes damn hard if you're thinking about competing against, uh, against gravitational wave detectors. Okay, so we've been looking at this not from the bottom up, but from the top down direction. And that's what I'm calling application inspired quantum sensing or quantum metrology, where you go to the application and you see how they do the best job they can do. You see what role quantum noise has in it. And you ask yourself whether quantum inf information resources can help that from the application perspective rather than from the quantum information perspective. And the, the, the oldest application of this kind, the oldest example, is gravitational wave detection. So this was started before quantum information was a topic, uh, looking with large interferometers, trying to detect very small distortions in, in space-time and very small phases in this way. And back in, in 1980, Carl Caves looked at this problem and said, here's a Michelson interferometer. What role does quantum noise have in this device? And this, this study was very interesting, both for physics, it taught us things about physics, and it also taught us things about these instruments. And maybe you, you all know this, but in Caves' analysis, the quantum noise here comes not from the laser, it rather comes from the vacuum fluctuations that enter into the interferometer from what everybody thought was an unimportant direction coming in here because there was nothing coming in. So that was something he taught us about the instruments, and he also taught us about physics, that it was possible to manipulate these quantum fluctuations 
that there's a device called the parametric amplifier, which should turn ordinary vacuum fluctuations into squeezed vacuum fluctuations. And that can be used if you inject it into your interferometer. You can reduce the noise that you see on your detector and thus improve the sensitivity of the device. Okay, so this is very interesting in terms of teaching us things about physics. Uh, it's also something which is giving fruit. So in 2011, the GEO 600 instrument was able to apply squeezing to their interferometer and reduce the noise level in this high frequency region, which is where the device is shot noise limited. And in 2013, the LIGO and one of the LIGO instruments was similarly enhanced. And you see again here the uh, improvement in sensitivity in this shot noise limited high frequency region. The American instrument uh, got there later, but they were able to do something that the German instrument was unable to do, which was to get all three colors of their flag into the figure. <laughs> and I understand that the Germans are exploring a similar strategy. <laughs> okay, so uh, after that, um, I'm going to be telling you about two results where I look at the operation of real instruments and I try to learn something about the quantum physics and how quantum information resources can, can help with this. Okay. So the first one came out, uh, I think, three weeks ago today uh, in Nature. And this one I managed to get on the archive this morning. Uh, so it's very fresh results. Okay, so what I'm working with is not optical entirely, it's an atomic application, it's optical magnetometry, where you use atoms to detect magnetic fields. So I have an ensemble of atoms, those are described by their spin, uh, the spin of the collection of all of the atoms, and in the presence of a magnetic field, that will precess, <coughs> precessing uh, magnetic uh, degree of freedom. And then in that way, the spins know about the magnetic field, and I can know what the spins are doing by passing a laser beam through, and that laser beam experiences Faraday rotation, and the amount of Faraday rotation is proportional to the projection of the spin on that axis. So I get to measure, in a non-destructive way, one component of the spin as it is evolving. Okay. So that's an optical magnetometer. This is an interesting technology. This is a paper which also just came out, a collaboration between Ameri an American company that makes these very small, very sen high sensitivity magnetic field sensors and a number of British groups that do neuroimaging and they put together the system where you can put many of these sensors on this helmet which then can detect the magnetic fields that emerge from the brain as someone is thinking or talking or doing see uh, a bunch of, of magnetic signals. Okay, so we wanted to understand the quantum physics of this. Uh, we went and we found the paper that has the record for the best sensitivity in this technique. That's this paper, it's a different group. It's not the, the same group that, uh, that did the magnetometer I just showed you. And I'd like to show you how this, this works. So again, there is uh, an ensemble of, of atoms and what they do with their atoms is first to polarize them along one direction, and then they allow them to evolve under the magnetic field. Okay, so the spin is precessing around, and at some point they turn on the laser, and they get a signal for a few cycles, and then they wait, and then they turn on the laser again, and they get a few more cycles of information. Okay, so this is the strategy that they have found which works best for improving the sensitivity of their device. Now, how does this give you a magnetic field measurement? Well, you get an angle uh, before and after the evolution. You get the time of the evolution. That tells you the rate of precession. And since you know uh, what the, the gyromagnetic ratio is for this atom, that tells you what the magnetic field is. Okay? So this, in this way, they're able to get a record sensitivity for this kind of measurement. So this is the strategy that we want to look at, understand the quantum physics of this. They get other information at the same time. So they get the amplitudes of these two components, okay, and that tells them 
uh, the strength of the spin that they had, the number of atoms that, that they were interacting with, and it also tells them the coherence time because there will be some decay in coherence over this time. And it turns out that's exactly the information that you need for doing magnetic resonance imaging, so this is somehow a problem that you find in, in several places. So what is the quantum noise in this kind of measurement? So uh, from a quantum information perspective, we're doing multi-parameter estimation. So we're trying to get a spin angle, we're trying to get a spin amplitude, and we're also trying to see it at, at multiple points in time. And what I think everyone expects is that this will be like looking at other oscillators. So if I take a harmonic oscillator, then that's a canonical system, it has canonical commutation relations, has the uncertainty relation that comes from that, and it means that if I measure one thing, I can make the uncertainty smaller in that thing, but I will make it something else is, is going to get worse. Okay. And this was worked out by, by Bradinsky way back in the 70s, that if you continuously watch an oscillator, then you'll get a total noise, which depends on how strong your measurement is, but has a sweet spot in it. And that's because you can measure badly and have too much readout noise. You can measure badly by measuring too strong and get more back action and the trade-off between these gives you the standard quantum level. Right? So this is somehow what we expect, and we're doing something similar. Yes? No. Um, because spin doesn't, isn't a canonical system, so it doesn't have a canonical commutation relation. It has this commutation relation, which means that it has this uncertainty relation, which doesn't have a constant on the right-hand side. It has the expectation of an operator on the right-hand side. Okay, so what does this mean? This means that if my state is, on average, in this plane, then I can have a zero on this right-hand side, and then I have no effective uncertainty relation between these two components. Okay? And that's exactly what my state is doing, that I started it out at this point, and it's precessing around. And that means I can, in principle, have a state that's squeezed in both components. Our, that, that was worked out by uh, Peter Grumman and Margaret Reed, and uh, he, whose name in Chinese I don't know, um, but uh, this, was, this was done by theoreticians studying the state space and saying there are states that have these properties. Our contribution in these papers is to show that the measurement strategy that's used in magnetometry, which is a dispersive measurement, so a non-destructive measurement of the spin, <coughs> naturally produces these states. And there's, it's described in these papers, but I can give you a clue about how this works. So the Faraday rotation is produced by an effective Hamiltonian that looks like this. It couples the component of the spin that we're measuring to the ellipticity of the light. Okay? That's what's necessary to cause this Faraday rotation. <coughs> that coupling has the effect of rotating the light, and it also has the effect of rotating the atoms but it's rotating it by the ellipticity of the light, which for linearly polarized light is just quantum noise. Okay. So when our state is over here, we send a pulse of light through, we get information, and we will reduce the uncertainty in this component. Okay. And then we will also cause a small random rotation of the state about this axis. And that will have the effect of reducing our uncertainty in this direction, but increasing it in that direction. As it goes around, we make another measurement here that will have the same effect of reducing the uncertainty in this direction, because we're measuring that component, and it will take this uncertainty ellipse and rotate it, which to first order actually has no effect. Okay. So through measurements all around the circle, we can reduce the uncertainty of both components in this plane, and the only uncertainty that gets larger is the outer plane component. And that's something that we never measure. So we wanted to do this. We use a system that we've been using for, for many years. It's cold atoms, which are held in a trap, which is very long and thin. It allows us to do these Faraday rotation measurements with high sensitivity and little damage to the state. We start the atoms in a polarized direction on the plane. We take many measurements as it does a free induction decay that gives us a 
we, we pick some point in time <coughs> that we want to know the spin. We have an estimate from the prior measurements. We have an estimate from the posterior measurements. That's like doing this experiment where we've reduced the time between the, uh, the two pulses to zero. Okay. And then what we look to see is, can do we get the same estimate for the state at this point in time where they meet? Okay. And if this first measurement agrees with the second measurement better than the standard quantum limit, it must be that the state itself had a noise that was below the standard quantum limit. Okay. And so that's what we do. Uh, in fact, we take many of these pre-induction decays and we look at the before and after estimates and we see how well they agree. And that's represented here. So as we estimate at different points in time, our average estimate moves around in this Procession uh, in this in this procession shape, uh, and then the dispersion. Each point here being the difference between the first estimate and the second. That dispersion gets smaller until it is below the standard quantum limit, and it stays below the standard quantum limit, and it's below the standard quantum limit for both components. Okay. To be quantitative about that, this is where we're taking the estimate, and. If we take the estimate early, then we don't do very well. But once we've got enough data to do a good estimate, then we get something which is below the uh, quantum limit here. So in the azimuthal direction, that's this. And in the radial direction, it's below the Poisson statistics that you would get from independent preparation. How much time do I have? You were up in your Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay, so how, how good can this be? You know, we, we improve this by about a factor of two and by about a factor of four. How good can this be? From the theory, uh, this can be significantly better than that. The limit on the standard quantum limit on the sum of these two components is this. You get a different scaling if you use <coughs> these states that were identified by uh, He, Drummond, and Reed. And it has this different scaling. There's a factor of n to the one third difference between these two. And remembering that we're talking about a thousand to a million particles here, or ten to the twelfth particles here, then that's a significant advantage. And so this pushes the quantum limits for these devices significantly beyond what people thought in, until then. Okay. So I thank the. Um, that's not the end of my talk. But I thank the people who did this first part. The next topic is a bit more abstract and maybe has a bit more uh, theoretical content and interest. So this is an essay that I just put on the archive which describes some things which have been bothering me about quantum sensing for many years and I finally figured out what they were and I finally put them down on paper. This standard model here assumes that the number of particles is a constant. You start with a certain number of qubits and you do what you can do. It also assumes that the thing that you're trying to estimate is interacting with each of the elements, but the elements are not interacting with each other. Okay? So these are two parts of what I would call the standard model of quantum sensing. And if I look at an application, so again this is magnetometry, this is the same group that set the record, this was the record that they had in 2003, uh, the number of particles that they have is something that they choose. It's not something that they're constrained by. And they explain it here. This is the atom number density, and this is how well they think their device is going to do in magnetic sensitivity and in coherence time. And they say, we want to work at this point because that's the sweet spot. Okay? So for them, particle number is not a constraint. Okay? So I want to ask, well, what happens if particle number is not a constraint in sensing? And you would think, well, since this gets better as your particle number goes up, and this also gets better as your particle number goes up. You just take n to infinity, and your uncertainty goes to zero, and the problem is solved, whatever strategy you take. But that's not actually the answer, and the answer is because the second uh, part fails if you take that strategy. 
and you can understand this, that the atoms interacting with the magnetic field are each independently interacting, and so you get a contribution, you get a Hamiltonian, which scales as the number of atoms. If you have some interaction between the particles, and that's never going to be zero, it might be small, it's never going to be zero, that's going to have a different scaling. So the number of particles that can interact with each other is n times n minus one, and so you have a different scaling there. And as you take n to infinity, at some point the interactions are going to become dominant. And you'll have an interaction dominated system. And it won't be described by the theory that gave you this one over square root of n or one over n scaling. Okay. So if you give up one of these, the other one is going to go with it. Okay. Um, and for the sake of time, I won't explain this. But gravitational wave detection, as well as magnetometry, fits this model. The reason that gravitational wave detectors use the number of photons that they do is limited by the interaction among the photons, which is described in these papers. Okay. So I wanted to know if doing things rigorously, you could actually get a quantum advantage from a system that has an unconstrained number of particles. And so what I did was to take the simplest thing that I could think of, which was a problem where I have a light source, and I'm, that's my quantum resource, I'm going to send in some number of photons in some state. It's going to pass through a medium, which is going to be an interesting medium for sensing. In particular, it's going to have a resonance in it, and I can estimate where I am relative to the resonance, and then I will do some, some detection. So I model that in the way you do in quantum optics, where I have an input field, an output field, and because there will be loss, then I have to introduce a reservoir field here. And I have this completely standard description for the passage of light through a material that has a phase, that has losses, and thus has added noise from, uh, from, from a reservoir. This is the, uh, the Lorentzian model that we use, and in order to make it a nonlinear problem, then the line width here is something which can grow in function of the number of photons that are sent through. Okay? This is called power broadening. You put more photons through your system and your resonance gets broader and that will eventually reduce your signal if you can get. Then we set an arbitrary Gaussian state, so it has a displaced, squeezed state and all of its degrees of freedom are open to be adjusted. That passes through our system due to the phase shift that gets rotated, both the mean and also the ellipse gets rotated. And because of the loss, it will become less squeezed. Then we measure one quadrature. So that's actually a general Gaussian measurement because we started with an arbitrary phase here. We can pick just one uh, one quadrature and measure that and have a general measurement and from that we calculate the Fisher information and the Fisher information tells us how much information you can get estimating the, the parameters that are, that are here. Now that turns out to be a tractable problem. We get analytic expressions. That's something that we can optimize. We do optimize that over all of the parameters of the state. Okay? So that includes the, the number, it includes the detuning, it includes everything that characterizes the probing of the system. <coughs> and then we can look at what the optimized results look like. If what we're trying to detect is our distance from our, our detuning from the center of the line, then this is what we see. If you allow yourself squeezed states, then you get these blue lines. If you only allow yourself coherent states, so this would then be the standard quantum limit, it would be use the best coherent state that you're allowed to use, that the best coherent state there is, then you get these red lines. And you see that there's a lot of stuff happening here, that you get reversals in behavior. So this is as a function of two parameters that describe the medium. One is how hard is it to saturate this medium, and the other one is how much material is there to be probed. Okay? And you see that there were reversals, that this can change its direction. There are phase transitions, that the best state can be a squeezed vacuum state or it can be a bright squeezed state and there's a transition between the two. Um, and you get 
regions where you get basically a constant advantage that the, the squeeze state is this much better than the coherent state, and you get places where you get an advantage that is different. So com complicated system. Uh, one thing that you see is that the for, for a given uh, saturation level and amount of material, you can have a much better value for the squeezed state than you do for the coherent state. Okay, so that answers my question. Can you rigorously get an advantage from using quantum resources in a system that is not constrained in particle number? And the answer is yes, but it's significantly different than what you see when, when you do it uh, when, when you do it with a, a constraint. Okay. Um, for people that work on imaging, I think this should also be an interesting problem. So this is now not trying to estimate the detuning, but trying to estimate the amount of material that's there. So it's trying to measure the optical depth. That's, that's the parameter that you're trying to estimate. And again, the, the blue are squeezed, the red are unsqueezed. And there's a region here where they coincide which means that the quantum resources don't help you. The best thing you can use is actually a squeeze state. And where is that? That's in an easily saturated uh, weak medium. And that, that holds also as you go to weaker media. So when you go from an optical depth that's about one or lower, and you have an easily saturated medium, then you don't get an advantage from using quantum resources. And I think this should be surprising to people that work on quantum imaging because that's exactly the region they usually talk about working in. A medium that's easily damaged and is optically thin so that you don't have a strong absorption. Okay. So obviously, uh, you know, this is one particular model, and if you change the model, the results might, might change, but I think it's something that, that people should be able to do. Okay. Um, so, uh, <coughs> Takeaway messages from this, in, in many practical instruments, particle, inter particle number is not a parameter. It uh, is, is a parameter, it's not actually a constraint. Okay. When you optimize an instrument for sensitivity by choosing the particle number, then the sensor inevitably becomes an interacting many-body system. Okay. So we have to be thinking about interacting many-body systems and the quantum physics of those if we want to understand this class of instruments. And then finally, at least in this model, which is a realistic model for, for, several, uh, uh, for several systems, then it is possible to get an advantage using quantum resources. Do I, do I have any time now? A couple of minutes. Well, so I, 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 or I used my time very badly. Um, we did something like this. So we took spin noise spectroscopy, which is just the magnetometer when you don't induce any polarization. You just use the random fluctuations of the spins. So you get a random signal, but it's still a random signal that's precessing at the Larmor frequency. And so you get a signal that looks like this. This is the spectrum of the noise, and you have a flat photon shot noise background, you have a contribution of spin noise at the Larmor frequency, and you can try to estimate the Larmor frequency and the line width from this. I mean, these are standard things that are done in condensed matter physics, especially in order to understand spin physics in condensed matter. And so we wanted to understand the quantum limits of that. We built a system for, for doing this. These are, for example, data with rubidium. You can see two lines, this is rubidium 85, this is rubidium 87. And then we worked out the quantum, we worked out the statistical theory of estimating parameters from noise spectra like this. And it turns out that the Fisher information can again be expressed in a very simple way. And when we put in standard models for spin physics and spin noise spectroscopy, then we can calculate the uncertainty that you get for estimating the Larmor frequency and the width as a function of number of atoms and number of photons, and there are global optima there. Okay. So this is a, an experimental problem 
where there is an optimum, where number optimization takes you to a particular place. And we confirm that, so this is the points are experiments, the lines are theory. And then we turn on a squeezer, and we can go from the coherent state limit, which has an optimum here. This is the global optimum for the whole system. We can do better than that by turning on the squeezer. So we have one experimental demonstration of a system that is better in an absolute sense. There's no use that you could make of this using classical resources that would do as well as these points here. So that's it. I thank my team. Thank you for your attention. extra noise, and it's this parametric amplification of fluctuations in the mirrors that is, gives them an additional noise source, which gives them an optimal photon number inside the cavity. That too, too few photons, you have extra phase noise. Too many photons, you get this parametric amplification, which gives you a different kind of noise. So they describe that there should be an optimum. Whether they're working at that optimum, I don't know. You said that squeezing is not always optimal, so I'm just wondering qualitatively, it's like probably somewhere in the next state, it's in the extreme, they to try that, right? High up of the right, the right part of the right there. So it's, it's an interesting question, I don't think I know the answer. So this is really interesting stuff. Uh, this is probably um, a, a silly question because I think people have talked a lot about um, uh, the relationship between sort of entanglement on one hand, chromatology and, and squeezing. But do, do you have a comment on? I mean, so, so none of these um, states that you're considering are, are entangled, I guess. Um, I, I guess they also don't need to be to, to get a quantum advantage. But can you, can you comment on that, given the, the sort of the idea that new states are, uh, are are using entanglement somehow to, to get their advantage. Uh, so, optical squeezed states like what I'm describing here are entangled. Okay. So there's a continuous variable entanglement between the higher frequency sidebands and the lower frequency sidebands. And if you if the sidebands are both in the vacuum state, then you have a coherent state. And if you want to have a squeezed state, then you have to put them in some kind of two mode squeezed state. So these are not single mode squeeze states. So they, there is no such thing as a single mode squeeze state. <laughs> okay. Uh, if, if you have something that has a reduced amplitude fluctuation, fluctuation implies time. If something is changing in time, then it has a frequency representation also. The only way for it to be squeezed is to have an entanglement in the frequency components. And the spin states are also entangled, as was shown by Drummond. One more question. Alex, maybe if you can get set up. Question. I was just wondering about the sort of quantum advantage you get by using multiple particles, uh, like most particle system. And is there anything sort of fundamental? Is it the number of particles that really matters? Or do you get quantum advantage as well when you have multi-dimensional systems instead? So, same number of particles, but each, one, each of them having higher number of dimensions. That's that's an interesting question. Um, I'm, I'm not I'm not an expert on use of multi-dimensional systems in order to get the same kinds of advantage. Uh, my my understanding is that in principle you can get anything from a multi-dimensional system that you can get from a multi-particle few-dimensional system, but that somehow the scaling is not advantageous. 
that you need to add dimensions faster than you add harder. But uh, uh, connecting it to this, I, I, I don't really connect it to this because uh, what I'm doing is going to the systems that are being used in magnetometers in this case, but in, in general to the systems that are, are used for practical applications. And those are usually few dimension systems. So we use atoms that are spin one, that's a three dimensional system, and that's somehow what we're stuck with. Thank you. I think uh, we'll call it that.